Well, this morning, we are privileged to have AJ back. AJ, how are things where you are? I don't even know where you are in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Good morning. So in at my end, uh, weather is okay. I'm somewhere mysterious place in Europe and <laughs> in this afternoon. Here. Uh, uh, all right. Well, in, in the myster in the mysterious place in Europe, uh, for those of you who this is the first time you've uh, listened to AJ, AJ prefers to remain anonymous, except for AJ. We get that much. And if you uh, are, you know, really, really good at things, you could, you know, you get his voice uh, and and somehow put that into some international, uh, you know, uh, a database and maybe you could figure out who AJ is. But anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but AJ, uh, you've become pretty famous for your uh, for your presentations on X, and we're glad to have you back uh, to talk this morning about the uh, the future of Tesla and how you're seeing things developing over the next uh, uh, let's call it the next 24 months, but with a lot of specificity about the uh, year 2025. Is that what we're going to do this morning? Uh, yes, exactly. I I just wanted to sort of kind of recap sort of the big big themes. Uh, why Tesla is like a phenomenal opportunity for investors, and then also um, not just talk about it sort of high level, but also sort of dive a little bit into the the, the nitty gritty minutia stuff. So to to basically show people, hopefully in a very accessible manner um that this is not like um a pipe dream uh right. pulled out of thin air and you know some high level assumptions <laughs> etc but but if you do like a really very granular bottom up analysis you, you can see how how basically tesla's um uh, uh legal blocks start to click into each other and 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 why and, and Tesla said this like 12 months ago on the earnings call that 24 is kind of a, a transition year between two major growth phases. We saw the first uh, major growth phase where Tesla went from a basically tiny company to a this year $100 billion revenue company, uh, which is similar to last year. That's why it was like a transition year. But we are about to enter Tesla's next phase. And, um, and, and hopefully I can show people that Tesla is basically primed to double revenue in the next two years. This is not a very long time horizon. Right, right. And that's kind of the path that they were on in the first, in the growth phase from uh, 2020 to uh, 2023, uh, every yeah. year, every two years doubling. And, and you're saying that that, that uh, phase is about to uh, reignite for the next yeah. two years. Yeah. And exactly. Tesla actually grew even faster. So yeah. if we look at, for example, uh, can can people see the first slide? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, excellent. So if you, for example, look at the, the first year. So this slide, big picture, shows total revenue uh, broken down by quarter. Um, the red bars is are the actually reported numbers by Tesla. So this is just the filings. And then the blue bars are based on, on my forecast which is bottom up and we will see how these um uh, numbers come together in, in a bit but if you just look at the red bars for a moment you, you see that the first year that i'm showing on this slide is uh, year 2020 and then ah. 2021 2022 and so on and then you see below the year number below 2020 you see 32 billion dollar yeah. Yeah, this is the, the total annual revenue of, of Tesla that, that was reported, and that number grew 28% compared to 2019. And then when you go to the next year, 2021, Tesla's revenue was 54 billion. It grew 71%, yeah. which basically caused a, a massive spike in the share price. We all know the history. Tesla market cap went through the roof. It was also a very good time for margins because uh, COVID started in the first quarter in, in, in the West in, in 2020. There were supply shortages, um, depleting global auto supplies, um, enabling automakers to charge very high prices for their vehicles. Um, so basically in 2021, stars aligned for Tesla, um, big, a lot of significant demand for the vehicles, Model Y, et cetera, uh, high margins and, and revenue went through the roof. 
So 54 billion, and this that year was followed in 22 with another 51% increase. It's also extremely high growth rate, 81 billion. And then in 2023, we started things to start to cool down a little bit. Um, this was a function of the global auto market uh, starting to starting to get saturated again. Inventory were sold up, supply chains were 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 up to speed again. Um, also, uh, we saw um, uh, residual values start to drop uh, from the very high COVID prices. So, so the auto market started to to enter a difficult phase, um, and and as a large automaker and very limited other revenue generated at the time. Of course, uh, Tesla revenue also took a hit at the time and, and grew, start to grow slower. And, and basically that extended uh, further and intensified into 2024. And that's why we see quote unquote only 4% year on year growth, which if, if you think if you, if you think about everything that happened in the global auto industry this is still a relatively good number because I see I follow the global auto market extreme, in, in, in extreme detail, and I see how a lot of auto makers struggle enormously and, and they're shrinking. Um, right. Some can sustain the revenue line, but not the volume, uh, just often just because of the financial arm with some other effects, uh, currency effects, for example, in Japan. But anyways, long story short, uh, Tesla still did quite well. In 2024, even though some people argue they didn't, but I would argue they did, okay. and 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 I think we are really just about we are about to move away from auto, and in the subsequent slides, you will see in detail uh, why. And and maybe um, before we go on, I just talk really quickly about the the forecast. So you see, this year, um, 2024. This, you see 100 billion is, is what I put here on the slide. This is based on the, the first nine months, which we know. So the 100 billion comprises only one forecast quarter, which is 4Q. And that number is largely driven by uh, Tesla management guidance. I, I suspect um, there's perhaps plus minus half a billion delta. Uh, and we'll find out in, in end of January. Uh, but long story short, this 100 billion is, is pretty much set in stone. I'm not worried about that number. And then next year is when stop, things become stop, start to become interesting. And then they go haywire in 2026. And so next year, we'll be probably going to see like 30% revenue growth. And, and we discuss later in detail why. And okay. then the, the really interesting bit and starts in, in 2026, where we actually grow 50% over 2025 in other words compared to 2024 this year we are bound to double revenue uh in the next two years and 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 then before we jump into detail i just want to recap real quick the big themes the big themes are haven't changed for tesla's the big themes are one there's still a shift towards electrification globally and and in particular to bevs Yes, um, plug-in hybrids and other types of hybrids, they're gaining popularity, but, but there's increasing evidence that people who bought a, a hybrid or a PHEV plug-in hybrid, they then often move on, they graduate to a, to a full electric vehicle. Um, so, so people should not get distracted by that. And, and ICE vehicles or internal combustion engine vehicles, they, they keep dropping everywhere. Um, China ice market is literally collapsing. Um, uh, Europe similar picture, um, very quick adoption of electrified vehicles and and, and still increasing uh, uh, BEV share, BEV battery electric vehicles, and and also the US. Uh, even though the media often makes it look like uh, there is stagnation or etc. Oftentimes when they talk about stagnation, they the stagnation is really just due to seasonal factors or some other factors, or there is some one-off effect because certain uh, incentives were, for example, Germany's best example, Germany, BEF sales in 2024, if you just look at the numbers, they look like they collapsed. But it, it's it's obvious, just as kind of a seasonal factor because last year there were massive incentives and, and all these incentives that disappeared in 2024, hence the, the, the 2023 inflation 
went away in 2024, so we, we returned temporarily to a normalized level, and hence going forward, sales, say, uh, best sales in Germany will be increasing, and is exactly what we see in the numbers. So as, as a long story short, there is no issue with global BEF adoption. Is it as fast as many people predicted? No, certainly not. But but it's still progressing, and, and we see a higher and higher penetration um, of BEFs globally. Um, you just need to make sure you, you look at the numbers uh, adjusted for seasonal factors, et cetera, and, and the trend is very clear. So that's the first big theme. Second big theme is, and this is, will be very, very interesting in the next two years, is... Um, the, the, the trend to to energy storage to better utilize our overbuilt global energy infrastructure and Tesla is very well positioned in, in, in that area with uh, its uh, energy and storage segment where it sells not only very large um, commercial batteries to commercial customers utilities etc but also where but to a much lesser degree, but where it also sells very successfully to mostly consumers, uh, home batteries, especially to people who might have a solar system on their roof, et cetera, to better utilize the solar system, et cetera. And, and this is a very strong trend and Tesla management is also very bullish about it. And the fact that Tesla has um, more than doubled this year, um, energy storage deployments, as Tesla calls it, um, shows you that there's enormous demand. And then when you sort of dig deeper, why people, why B, B2B is a business to business customers, why these customers, commercial customers buy these mega packs, it's obvious because depending on where you are in the world, you can literally print money with these machines right now because these, mach these batteries, they often buy at negative energy prices excess energy if for example in uk if, if there's a storm in the uk uh, going over the island uh, the the uk often overproduces energy because they have a lot of wind energy and they just overproduce so they, they basically beg people to take energy and and there you can quote unquote buy at negative prices energy you charge your battery and then when the storm is over and and Every day in the morning and in the evening, there are peak electricity. There's peak electricity demand, the famous duck curve. Uh, you can sell that that energy that you were paid for to buy back to the grid. Of course, it's an extreme situation, but there are there's there's also the situation where you can just every day buy very cheaply energy, and then later at peak demand you can uh, return to the grid. So the, the business model is very simple, and um, and because of how the global energy system works. Um, there's a very sustainable case for a long time. Uh, Tony Sieber, I think, has done fantastic work on the topic. He basically demonstrated how, how the, the, the optimal ratio between lowest cost energy production, which is solar, uh, and, and how batteries can augment that system and, and how there's a synergistic effect. And I won't go into more detail uh, on this point, but this is a very strong trend, and, and this is one that Tesla fully addresses. And then lastly, which is probably the elephant in the room, but this is probably a, a little further out, is, is obviously the AI opportunity. And the AI opportunity comprises, of course, FSD or autonomy, uh, robotaxis, and also robotics. Uh, when I talk in this presentation about robotics, I basically refer to Optimus, but I'd like to point out Optimus is just humanoid bot and it's highly conceivable that uh, tesla will extend that product line in the future and who knows what type of bots uh, we will we will see uh, so this is also something to keep in mind and, uh, and and of course these are just the things we know now and when you when you if you're someone who studied tesla for a long time you you see the evolution in the company and how it has morphed from basically a tiny niche EV sports car maker to a global automotive uh, energy and AI company, it's it's probably also not too far-fetched to assume that there will be products we have no clue about yet and that don't show up here, but will be showing up in the future. So anyways, with that out of the way, I pause for a second before I move into sort of the, the next slides. Okay. All right. So, so basically, uh, this is a revenue a revenue projection by you, uh, which is based, if I understand it right, you're 
you're using Tesla's own words. You're using the words yeah. of Musk or the other executives uh, yes. to project uh, based and 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 a lot of the growth uh, in the next two years would come from the traditional automotive business. But then as we get deeper into 2025 and 2026, we would see the beginnings of, of uh, the, ex the dramatic expansion of energy, dramatic, even yes. more dramatic expansion of FSD, probably uh, robotaxis beginning and, and the beginnings of yeah. revenues there. And then in 2026, uh, probably extreme increases in robotaxis plus the beginning of revenues for Optimus. Would that be a fair, a fair? Yeah. Okay. That, that, I think that's 90% correct. The only thing where, and we we'll get to it later, this forecast contains actually relatively little robotaxi, and, and, and you will see why later. Um, so the main driver of, of the two forecast cast years here is really, uh, is really energy plus the scaling of the auto business, because there are parts in the auto business people don't really have on the radar, which are not that sexy, but they also add meaningful revenue, and we'll get to it. Um, but but the the AI robotaxi opportunity is really a more a twenty twenty six story with very little impact on on twenty twenty five. So we do not depend significantly um, on, on robotaxis. For the 2025 year, certainly. Um, but otherwise, I think this is a very good summary. And I, I just want to, to emphasize when I do this forecast, my, my, my philosophy is always I try to be, I basically try to replicate in the numbers what management told us. Right. Um, I only deviate if, if something might be a little far out. But but basically, I try to take management's word and and, and and try to turn it into sort of a realistic scenario how this all then kicks off. Like if Tesla tells me, oh, we have this product starting in, in this quarter, um, I then consider all the sort of the real world ramifications like the ramp up and and and, uh, and, and, and other like minutiae to come up with like what, what I think would be a plausible scenario so this is sort of the, my big picture because i try to inject as little as i can uh of aj <laughs> into these projections <laughs> uh, just very clear okay okay so is that out of the way so let's move on to sort of the breakdown um of this uh total revenue stream and here you see the numbers that you see on the slides, uh, 62.3 billion, this is exactly the total that you ha have here, 62 billion, just rounded. But okay. here on this slide, we basically see the full breakdown, how, how you get to that uh, 62 billion in, uh, in, the, in, in 4Q of 2026. And, and you can basically see here, um, I broke this um, um, down into sort of the, the main the main revenue drivers and you can see uh, if we start with like the biggest bar which is the the model 3 model y line the reason um the reason why i think and you can see it has come down basically a little bit uh, i'm talking about the first bar here um it has come down a little bit um for the reasons that i mentioned before but in 2025 i believe we will see um an increase in revenue and so, sort of the key drivers already set out here but but just to summarize i i expect i totally expect that we will see a a refreshed model y in 2025 right we we have already seen various leaks some of the very large Tesla accounts don't like to share them because they don't want to get a issue with Elon, <laughs> uh, but I have seen these pictures. They, they look highly credible. Uh, they also would match perfectly with the 2025 H1 uh, launch timeline. Typically, about six months before launch, you see these leaks emerge because it's unavoidable. Tesla has to road test these cars. There's just no way around it, and everybody has a camera in their pocket, so leaks is just a matter of time. So as a long story short, I expect um, refresh Model Y. And, and this will basically uh, give, especially Tesla customers who owned a Model Y for a couple of years, uh, a lot of incentive to upgrade. Because right now, to be honest, if you have a three-year-old Model Y, what is your incentive to upgrade? There isn't really any 
because buying essentially the same car. And but but uh, when you look at the refresh Model Y and you see what they upgraded, it, it's completely logical to assume that all these upgrades will totally carry over to the new Model Y, and and some features will be highly appreciated by some customers. For example, a perforation of the seats and, and, and seat ventilation is a great feature. Some people love the ambient lighting and things like that. And I, I probably, I believe there will be a front lift. And I also believe there will be a slight up segmenting in the Model Y in preparation of making a little bit of room at the low end for the upcoming more affordable models. Right. And, and, and this is like people who study automotive for, for a long time and know that that automakers generally take the most popular model and with every and typically the automotive cycle is about four years and every four years they, they there's usually after two years kind of a refresh um sometimes annually slight cosmetic changes after two years a little bigger change and then after four years like a proper new model is typically how, how the most popular models are being refreshed and this has been a very successful system, and and um, and and what automakers typically do, they they try to upscale it a little bit. For example, the BMW 3 Series ha has been enormously successful model for BMW, not so much lately, but but if you go back to the 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 late 90s, early 2000s, was extremely successful, and uh, it was a much smaller, lower segment vehicle. And over time, they upscaled it, upscaled, upscaled it until it became like a really more premium product. And and uh, Merck has done it with the E-Class, uh, BMW also did it with the 5 Series, uh, uh, Audi with, with, with A4, blah, 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 tons of examples. And uh, it makes sense. You basically give the current owner a reason to upgrade to a more to a better product and you charge them more. So this is like very, you know, this is like uh, very in, in the weeds automotive stuff here. So I think <laughs> Tesla will do something of this. So the, so the, 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 the basic, if I'm right, you will see with the refresh that the Model Y price range will slightly move up. So, so the band was between the highest price and lowest price Model Y would slightly move up. And this then um, enables Tesla to in, inject the more affordable model in a more... Um, let's say, in, in a better price pr price bracket, they don't need to go too far down to create enough of a niche. Because if there's not enough of a niche, you have cannibalization problem and, and stuff like that. And, and also, Elon said um, not long ago that a $25,000 vehicle doesn't make sense uh, as, we, as we are about to get robotaxes. So I think the more affordable vehicle that is about to launch in H1 2025 is not a $25,000 vehicle. It will be probably more around the $30,000 price point plus minus 2K for the high end and the entry level trim. So this would be my guess. Okay. But, but anyways, so so we probably shouldn't move on. Otherwise, it's going to take too long. But long story short, there, there, and, and of course, the big drivers is there will be global BEV market continues to expand. Um, so, 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 so long story short, there's also lower interest rates. There, there are a lot of reasons, and the cost of, of BEVs coming down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Charging infrastructure is getting better, uh, batteries are charging faster. So, I, I think you should be it's better to be bullish about S and uh, y sales and then bearish so that's why i think there will be an increase that's why this is going up but then other revenue lines s and x you can see s and x um barely makes a difference uh i will talk briefly about this later the the the, the product that will make a big difference in 2025 is is the cyber truck you can see this bar here this this bluish uh, bar, I should have used a different color kind of code, but but you can see this starts to make a big dent, and we get into detail later why. Okay. Then the next ge next generation product is this a more affordable product I just mentioned that Tesla announced early earlier this year, and which will which is slated to launch in just a few months. Is here the gray bar. Um, in 2025, you see it makes very little impact because simply Tesla has to ramp production. Uh, it, it's a lower average selling price product. So this is also really hitting mostly in 2026. Uh, might surprise some people. Then the semi is also a 2026 story. It starts ramping, still very little impact because the semi factory is slated to be completed in, in 1Q uh, 2026. 
uh, credits. So there's a debate about whether credits will be will lose credit sales. However, um, I think the the story is not as cl clear cut as people make it out to be because a lot of people think a uh, Trump or a Doge will cut credits. I think this is a very low political uh, uh, priority target because credits is is n is not directly affecting the budget because credits are borne by the OEMs and not by the government. Right. So so that makes it. And, and then the other thing is, the uh, credits are concentrated in the large California market. So so when you look at Tesla's total credit sales, the the, the the lion's share comes from California. And um, California is Democrats, Democrats controlled, right? And and California had for decades like a a, a special rule that, that was carved out for them, so they could have like higher emission standards. And then typically the rest of America would take over those higher emission standards. But but anyways, I think credit is actually a low priority political target or budgetary target, and hence I, I don't think this, this. And and also if if Trump decides to cut it. How does he cut it? Like immediate stop? There are a lot of legal hurdles to overcome. And as you know, this takes months uh, to get it done. Or will there be a phase out? And, and so anyway, for this relatively short forecast, we're talking only about two years. I see limited risk of it going away. I can be wrong. But but anyways, and you can also see in terms of revenue, it doesn't make a big difference. Uh -huh. However, it has a it has a disproportional um, uh, earnings impact because it's 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 basically a pure profit revenue, hence because you have literally no cost against it. So, so this is something obviously to keep in mind. So, if if this chart was done on earnings, uh, the bar would be much bigger, of course. But it's still you will see later, even if Tesla is losing that earnings line in the in the twenty twenty six and the twenty twenty six time frame, this this becomes less and less a problem. Um, so, and then if we move on, leasing is another line. Tesla has always been. <laughs> And this comes probably to, as a surprise to many people, is actually very, and is managed by automotive standards in a very risk averse manner. Tesla is not using the very expensive volume driver leasing sales. They, they right. only do leasing in a very limited way, at least on their balance sheet. Uh, that there are partners, banking partners, who take care of the leasing, but but Tesla is very little has a little, very little stake in that. And there are a bunch of reasons why. For accounting reasons, uh, leasing sales make your numbers look worse. And, and also, if when you do a leasing business, you have to, at inception of the leasing sale, you as the automaker, you have to make assumption of the resale value. And, and, and if you put yourself into the mindset of Tesla, in the last few years, this was very tricky because we had these peak car prices. So, of course, resale values were bound to drop. Tesla is smart, they knew it, and that's why they didn't indulge in leasing. Other automakers did. For example, BMW had a massive negative cash flow, largely because of that in one Q of this year. Uh, they still struggled to, anyway, not talking about BMW. So long story short, they, they were very prudent, prudent with that potential volume lever. Plus, when you think about the autonomy future, what's going to happen? Resale values drop. So, so for that reason, and of course, and I believe them, Tesla obviously is fully convinced we are on the verge of autonomy. Hence, all these these um, these leasing deals make no sense. Plus, Tesla always said, uh, "You do not have the right to buy the leasing vehicle." Right. This also makes it less attractive. So, uh, and, and Tesla is not going to change the policy, and hence. Um, and so leasing is simply not very attractive to Tesla, but also not to Tesla customers. So that's why the leasing line is unlikely to to become like a big revenue line, in my view. And then we, we come to something very interesting. Now we get to ENS. ENS stands for the energy and storage segment. But when we talk about the energy segment, it's really about storage. So it should be called S and E, really. But is it, and but 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 anyways, so so the energy business is, is bound to grow explosively, and we we'll get to it in a bit. And then we have the robotics. But you see, the robotics is is adding very little or basically nothing in 2025, and 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 you will see the ramp up curve. So there's basically zero optimus here in 2025, and there's a little bit coming online 
in um, in 2026, Linux explain how I, I think it will unravel. And then we get to um, FSD subscriptions. FSD subscriptions, they it's hard to see right now. That they make a very small contribution, and and but again, FSD subscription is similar to credit sale. It's like a a pure profit line. Uh, but there is some cost against it, and I will talk about this later, but it, it's mostly like software margin. It's a very attractive business. So even though the bar is very small, it has a disproportional impact on earnings. Come to keep in mind. And then we go to RH customers. This is my abbreviation for, for the ride hailing network where Tesla customers contribute their vehicle to the network. Where uh, um, where then Tesla manages the rides via the app, etc., and where and, and and you know this very well, Randy, where basically the Tesla customer can earn a little bit of revenue from from lending their car to the Tesla network, and, and it goes out and, and basically acts like a robo taxi. Um, so this I expect on a small scale to kick in next year based on management guidance. Um, and then there's the ride hailing network Tesla, which is basically the robo taxi. This is this is this is Cybercap. The so RH Tesla ride hailing Tesla is Cybercap. This you can also see there's basically an, almost no revenue impact here because I expect this to kick in next year. And what people need to keep in mind when they talk about Cybercap, the Cybercap fleet compared to the customer fleet, Cybercap fleet is zero. And next year when they start production, it's zero. So in, in a given quarter, the average fleet size is what matters. And this just needs to ramp up. And that's why the initial revenue will not be as high as people often think, just because you can't magically produce half a million robotaxes. So, but, but we talk about this later. But And then the last piece, which is also very interesting, and I think this is maybe the most underappreciated segment of Tesla's revenue sort of composition is the SNO. SNO stands for service and other. So right. service service obviously is um, maintenance of vehicles. And, and here in particular, there's also some one very interesting point here. So 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 Tesla owns all the service center. And but when 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 a customer has a has a problem, something is not working, blah 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 because Tesla was growing so quickly and Tesla has like a relatively generous warranty policy, relatively many miles and relatively many years for, for, for the key components. If something is wrong with, with a Tesla, typically it's Tesla who pays for it. So there's no revenue for Tesla, but um, we are, we are slowly entering in a stage where there's an, where, where there's an, a significant increase of the out of warranty fleet and 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 the, the interesting pieces compared to a traditional OEM who, who has dealerships which are not owned the OEM only captures the part sales but not all the other serving uh, service stuff in Tesla's case it's different Tesla not only captures the the, the sale of the parts revenue but also the everything else that it has to do with service um, so, so the, the revenue generation of Tesla's out of warranty fleet will be much higher than an equivalent out of warranty fleet of a legacy OEM who does not uh, own the dealership. So the dealership margin on the service goes to Tesla while the OEM uh, can't extract it from the dealer because they need to have some margin to live off something so so, so th this this makes us more interesting and then also the o in service and other other it's very interesting because other includes um the the, the global uh, charging network and and tesla started to basically open up the network pretty much everywhere to almost everyone so so, so almost the entire global uh, electric vehicle fleet becomes kind of a customer to tesla and and this starts to make a difference. And, and I noted something very nitty gritty, only finance people will pick up on. Uh, Tesla changed the order. So Tesla basically in the SEC filing provides uh, what items are included in the line item. And, and typically the gold standard amongst financial professionals is that you list the most important item first. And then the second one, if you make an enumeration, this is how you do it. In every large bank, you're being trained that way. 
analyst training, etc. It's basically analyst one-on-one -on -one training. And I noticed Tesla changed that order. Oh. So I think I think this might be again very nitty gritty stuff, but it's, this might be indicative that this is starting to move the needle. And and um, so yeah, and it's obvious. I mean, at some point, it, 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 there, there is in, it, significant revenue. Um, I did some modeling on that. It will never be like a giant revenue line because you the, the there's simply not not enough. Because a lot of people charge at home, right? right so when right. we talk about the supercharger network revenue, we're only talking about long distance. And and some people, and, and Rivian actually <laughs> dropped a very interesting number, which is obviously not fully transferable to Tesla, but but they said something like most of their customers never did supercharging. Right. So they basically just drive around town, basically. And um, but but anyways, so it's a long story short. Um, if you do some, what I think, sensible modeling, it will never be huge revenue line because also the problem is it's like the Apple problem. Uh, <laughs> Apple became so big that even if you have like a killer new product, it still doesn't move the needle because the revenue has become so big that that yeah, this is a luxury problem. And, and, and for that reason, charging will probably never be a major item because Tesla just keeps growing other stuff so so much faster. Anyways, but it's just something to point out because of all this little stuff, all this little stuff adds. And, and, and because Tesla has so many little revenue streams that are starting to kick in, um, even though each individually doesn't make a big difference, but if you add everything up, it does actually make a difference, especially when it comes to year-on-year -year growth. And there's something to keep in mind. And uh, so with, with that, I would, I would jump into, actually, let me check the uh, time. Uh, I think we're good. Um, so maybe I, I would, yeah, maybe let me stop here to give you, Randy, a chance to maybe react. If, if actually, you actually, I haven't jumped in because it's uh, very, very clear, very, very, uh, uh, very, you know, I didn't really have any questions. It all makes total sense. I mean, there's tons of things we could talk about, but that would hit, take yeah. us all kinds of rabbit holes. So uh, let's, yeah, yeah, exactly. let's, go ahead yeah. with, let's go ahead with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This this analysis is full with rabbit holes. This is the tricky part. You can get really bogged down really quickly. So so let's talk about here about the the model Y, um, model three revenue line. This is basically, for example, here if you look at this number, twenty seven point eight billion for the fourth quarter of two thousand twenty six. If you go back to the to the summary slide, this is this number here. This is how everything links together. Right and and um, and and you see okay here it's relatively flat 2023 it has even come down you can see we had like a in that revenue line we have a drop the volume stayed relatively stable you see this later um, but uh, the revenue has come down and the reason is average selling prices have, have come down um, at Tesla reduced prices uh, gave discounts uh, things like that. Um, also, there's an impact from financing because when Tesla um, offers zero percent financing, there is a kind of a haircut to the revenue Tesla receives. So um, uh, this makes the, the margins look worse. But anyways, but but you didn't see that in 2025. I, I do expect like an eight percent increase in the revenue line. And again, this is I think significantly driven by a refreshed Model Y because the the Model Y gets really old. It's by automotive stands, uh, it's already overdue for a refresh. And, um, and and as I said earlier, there's evidence online that there's a refresh. Also, I know people in, in the global automotive supply chain, and I can't get into in too much detail, but all I can say on this call um, publicly is there is indication in the supply chain, there are big orders being placed and something is happening and this is going to happen next year and increasingly in 2026. So th there's a lot of reason, I think, uh, for optimism here. Um, and, and then also you see it, uh, the, the bars, they, they kind of go up and go down and, and go, go down again and up. So I, I try to also reflect global seasonality in auto market. This is a real thing. Uh, this is primarily dr driven by, by two things. One is winter. Uh, a lot of very large auto markets, as I joked last time, <laughs> Randy, not everybody lives in California. In, yeah. in many, many large auto markets like um, uh, the 
the northeast of the US, uh, in Canada, uh, Germany, UK, France, uh, even Italy, uh, northern Italy, um, they're all affected by winter and, and people simply buy fewer cars. You can see this very, very clearly in long term quarterly vehicle sales trends, no matter what country you take. And, and then there's one other factor that that keeps becoming more severe, which is uh, Lunar New Year in Asia, and this is driven by um, by the Asian auto market, especially China, becoming more uh, becoming a bigger and bigger percent of the global auto market, and hence when they do the Lunar New Year, and this happens every year in 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 the first quarter, the 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 auto sales drop massively for roughly two weeks. And, and this then always has like, a, together with winter, has like a, a significant demand dampening effect in one queue, right. which then unwinds in subsequent quarters. And then and then also there is, in, in certain markets, there's a large um, second half, or I should say four queue seasonality. And uh, so long story short, this forecast tries to account for that basically based on Tesla's historic modeling adjusted for uh, one of effects, et cetera. Uh, for example, here, here you see the first quarter here, a massive drop. This was not only seasonality, but this was also like, a, the, you know, the Red Sea conflict uh, where, you know, the, the, yes. the, the ships had to take the long round around Cap Horn instead of going through Suez. Uh, Tesla Berlin was shut down twice, once because of port shortages, a second time because of the arson attack where the, the transformer energy transformer was destroyed had to be rebuilt uh, anyway there's a lot of stuff in here this quarter went down because we didn't have model 3 in europe for i think over a month because it was a transition uh, to the, the refresh model um, also this quarter was affected because fremont model 3 production was ramping Again, because of transition, this quarter was the Shanghai transition. This quarter was the Fremont transition. There is no transition in Europe because Berlin only produces Model Y. So it's not, there's there's a lot of one-off effects, and so I, I I do not account in my forecast for one-off effects, but I do account for seasonal effects. And this right. is a consistent across all automotive products. I, I separate I model separately uh, S and X, uh, the the new upcoming affordable model. Um, Cybertruck, of course, the only ex exception to this is uh, Semi, because Semi is B2B business, uh, winter has less of, of an effect on, on B2B type business. Sure. And uh, so sure. anyway, so so I, I would recommend every, everyone who is uh, watching, listening, uh, take a minute, read through the bullets. There's a lot of stuff I can't really cover, because otherwise this call would be, you know, <laughs> you could be talking like a, literally a, could do, a, do an all-day workshop on this analysis but ba basically what you see is um, I, i've i've covered tesla for many many years mm -hmm. and a lot of this is just a, um, a condensed output of everything i learned over many many years and um so with that maybe we move on to um to model s and x uh, you can see my forecast assumes very little sort of um, momentum from the S and X line yeah. uh, simply because number one in 2025, I do not expect a refresh. I also expect that there will be some continuing cannibalization of the S and X sales from Cybertruck. Cybertruck is just the, the newer, cooler product, but every cool new product factor wears off at some point. And I think, at some point next year, as Cybertruck becomes ubiquitous and this novelty factor goes away, people who are not really truck people will start to go back and reconsider like a limousine because a limousine has other advantages. Oh, yeah. and, and also a large SUV. Uh, and also in terms of S and X sales, uh, X sales are roughly two thirds and one third roughly um, S sales. So, so I think there will be some normalization and then for 2026, I would expect um, Tesla to do a, um, a refresh. Mm -hmm. They don't need to refresh the battery pack, not the drivetrain. They just need to refresh uh, really the exterior cosmetic changes and um, maybe upgrade a little bit the interior. And I'm sure they could easily 
grow sales by 50% because simply people buying vehicles in this price range, we're talking about 80, 90, $100,000 vehicles, depending on where you live, could be even more after taxes. And they want their vehicle that looks new. And yeah. the problem with the S and X line is that non-Tesla nerds from 30 yards cannot tell apart a right. one-year-old S and X from a 2016 S and X. Yes, yes. yes. That is the primary problem. And, and basically we're talking, you cannot tell apart a one-year-old and an eight-year-old vehicle. And this is just no-go. And even people like Porsche understood that even they have this iconic shape, even they know that every new model has to look sufficiently different so it sells. And yeah. and this is something I think Tesla dropped the ball on that one. Uh, but but it, very easy tweaks that they can easily boost ourselves so anyways but but still you can see in terms of revenue i don't expect like a huge revenue booster this is i think upside potential i think if tesla does some decent cosmetic changes to the product there could be some little upside uh, because you can see that in 2023 it was a lot more revenue and actually if we went back further right after the the refresh launch um there was even more revenue so, so the, the, the we know the product can sell, but it needs to be kind of uh, newer. So then, then we move on to um, the Cybertruck revenue. Cybertruck is very, very interesting for 2025. You can see the, the scaling here. We had the launch in 4Q uh, 2023, late November, barely any deliveries. Of course, Tesla was just launching. So. I, I don't even show a number here because it's not meaningful. Then it started ramping. Um, and keep in mind, this is in billions. Um, and then, uh, so I estimate um, sales were 1.5 billion in, in last quarter, and we probably exceed slightly 2 billion in the, in, in the current quarter. And then it grows very quickly. And I see the main drivers are, first of all, at Tesla keeps ramping up production and Tesla guided that they expect annual sales of about a quarter of a million. Um, you, you see here that in 2025, and we, we get, I actually have, have this, the sales numbers here, a little different slide. This slide has not yet been published. Um, you can see that I expect uh, Tesla to hit that number on an, in 2025, basically, uh, the point. Two four million, so there's two hundred forty thousand vehicles, and then I expect it actually grows further. It goes to three hundred twenty thousand vehicles in twenty twenty six, and wow. but I now I now jump back to the the revenue line, and and so the, the reason why I think it's um it's growing that quickly is first, let's recap what we know already. Cybertruck already sells more units than all other. EV trucks on the market in the US. Right. Um, so, and, and there are several. There is there's the Hummer, there, there is the, the, the Lightning, there's the R1T from Rivian, of course. Um, there is also two different ones from General Motors. Um, so there, there's a lot of EV trucks and, and all the trucks I just mentioned, they launch at least one quarter before the Cybertruck or sometimes years before the Cybertruck. So they fully ramped, blah, 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 established products, and still Cybertruck outsells all of them. And, and given what we see among celebrities and et cetera, it's highly popular. It, become like, it became like a cultural icon in many ways. And, and, and also when you see the reaction internationally, when people get to see Cybertruck because Tesla does a tour or actually some customers actually bought one in the US and then export it to their home country and they make videos. And so there's an enormous um, interest. And, and, and for example, I, live a, I, live, I have a situation where I have absolutely zero use for a pickup truck. And I yeah. never, ever for a second considered buying a pickup truck yeah. um, just on dry, driving dynamics. But I have to be honest. If I get the opportunity to buy one in my country, <laughs> there is a there is a major risk that I might buy one, yeah. even though it makes even though it makes absolutely no sense to me. It has it has huge downsides in terms of parking and stuff like that. But even I would be highly tempted to buy one. I think I'm not the only person. You're and there right. will be other people. So anyway, long story short, I think there is a, a, a meaningful international demand pocket to be tapped into 
I don't know, maybe it doesn't last, but at least for my forecast period, I think there will be enough demand. So what I mean, so maybe there's a like a demand bubble internationally because it's cool, yeah. uh, which might go away in the future. So my 340K estimate, my, no, my uh, 320K estimate here in 2026 might not be sustainable, but long term, it doesn't matter because in later years, the AI stuff kicks in. Yeah. So this is also not, should not be a distractor to investors. And so anyway, so so anyway, so bottom line, the next two years, Cybertruck will, will add some very nice revenue, especially when we then add the lower cost model. Uh, and and the other thing, so, so the lower cost model is the $60,000 entry level uh, has not yet launched, but Tesla announced it um, when they launched uh, in, in 4Q 2023. So it's around the corner, and um, it's one one other important point I want to mention, which I just slipped. <laughs> so both BJ and I need to split right now. We both have other responsibilities that we have to take care of. So we're going to end part one right now, uh, AJ, and uh, and we'll be looking forward to tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll we'll do this again, and we'll finish up the other categories, and and we will. Uh, put everybody off in terms of finding out what the final numbers are and what the final price targets are, but they'll, they'll get that tomorrow. So uh, thanks AJ for coming on today and uh, uh, going through this uh, elaborate information. And for people that want to go into more detail, of course, they can look you up on X uh, and uh, there you go under a low Joe. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. A L O J O H. Okay. All right. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me, Randy. Okay, and uh, until tomorrow then, for everybody, it has been great talking to you.